Hello, I am Victor Ethelstan, and welcome to the sixth episode of the Medieval Monk Podcast. On my Instagram story, at the underscore medieval underscore monk, medieval spelt M-E-D-I-A-E-V-A-L, I did a poll on what the next podcast episode should be. The topics were medieval monastic underwear, the rule of St. Benedict, and the dialogue on miracles. As you can tell, my followers chose the topic medieval monastic underwear. I'm happy to return to this topic, and yes, you heard me correctly, I did say return. On December 20th, 2020, um, almost a year ago, I wrote an article about medieval monastic underwear. You can find it on my blog. There will be a link to that article in this episode's description uh, in case uh, you prefer to read. The article is titled Medieval Monastic Clothing Part 3, Medieval Monk's Underwear and Lack of It. All the sources I used to write that article, as well as the script for this podcast episode, can be found at the end of that article. Again, I will be linking the article in the description of this episode. I also briefly discussed monastic underwear in episode three of this podcast. There, I gave some basic information about this particular item of clothing. But today, I will be going further into further detail. Anyway, let's begin talking about uh, medieval monastic underwear. For context, the rule of St. Benedict is a guideline for monastic life. It was one of the most popular monastic rules in the Middle Ages. Chapter 55 of the rule of St. Benedict discusses what kind of clothes a monk should wear. The chapter also has a guideline for underwear. The entire chapter is several paragraphs long, so I will only read the sentence St. Benedict wrote on underwear. And yes, St. Benedict only had uh, one sentence worth of things to say about underwear. As a side note, I am using D. Oswald Hunter Blair's 1906 translation. His translation is in the public domain and can be found online for free. Anyway, here is what St. Benedict had to say about monastic underwear. Quote, Let those who are sent on a journey receive drawers from the wardrobe and on their return restore them washed. Unquote. Basically, this means that monks should wear underwear, also referred to as drawers, whenever they leave the monastery. The underwear should be washed as soon as the monk returns home. Due to the vagueness of this sentence, St. Benedict's opinion on drawers can have multiple interpretations. The first interpretation is that St. Benedict wanted monks only to wear drawers slash underwear slash breeches when they left their monastery. However, it could also be interpreted a second way. Monks should wear underwear all the time, but especially when they went out in public. After all, monks wore habits with long skirts. Anyone who has ever worn a skirt knows that one strong gust of wind means accidentally flashing a crowd, no matter how long that skirt is. As monks were, are supposed to be chaste and modest, Accidentally flashing people, whether they are your fellow monastics or secular folk, is undesirable and should be avoided at all costs. It is especially embarrassing if you accidentally expose yourself to the king, but more on that later. St. Benedict's vague instructions about how and when to wear drawers set off centuries of debate regarding monastic underwear. If I had to guess, I don't think St. Benedict intended for all the controversy over underpants to happen, but it sure did. Before I get into my favorite part, all the petty historical drama, I want to emphasize that most medieval monastic orders did wear underwear. When I first did research on this topic in December 2020, I saw a lot of articles claiming that medieval monks never, ever wore underwear. That is simply not the case. Um, And by articles, I mean just like basic like blog articles, nothing written by like actual historians, uh, just mostly people trying their best. Um, so like with most historical rules, if there is a text telling people not to do something, that implies people were in fact doing the thing, whatever that thing may be. 
So even though the rule of St. Benedict implies, in theory, a monk shouldn't wear underwear while inside his monastery, there's plenty of documentation showing monks did do this in practice. I've selected seven pieces of evidence proving this to be the case. Of course, there's more evidence out there, but I decided to cut the list off at seven for brevity's sake. Example one, when the king of the Franks, Louis the Pious, wrote his Capillaria Monasticism, uh, a monastic capillary, uh, pardon for any mispronunciation, he specified that monks should be allowed two pairs of drawers. Example two, St. Edelhard of Corby's role for canons also said monks could own two pairs of drawers. St. Edelhard was Charlemagne's cousin. He lived in the 8th and 9th centuries. Example three, the Clunic sign language had a sign for drawers. Monks used sign language to communicate with each other when they were not allowed to talk. Individual monastic orders had different signs for different things. Interestingly enough, even different monasteries in the same monastic orders could have different signs for different words. Example four, in the monastic constitutions of Lanfranc, Lanfranc instructs monks to be fully dressed when they walk around the cloister. He specified that only wearing underwear or going barefoot does not count as fully dressed. Lanfranc was a Benedictine monk as well as the Archbishop of Canterbury after the Norman Conquest. Example 5. Emperor Henry II of the Holy Roman Empire gave money to a monastery so the monks could buy themselves some new underwear. Example 6. In the Flemish monastery Andres, a monk mooned his abbot after he asked for new drawers and the abbot said no. As funny as this is, I will note the monk only did this after tensions escalated between the monastic community and their new abbot. The abbot, Geoffrey Bertram, was not particularly liked at Andres. Geoffrey Bertram's monks considered him to be much too spiritual. While medieval abbots did need to be spiritual, it was also important for them to be worldly. It is impossible to run a community of any kind effectively without knowing how the world works. If you don't, it's extremely easy to get taken advantage of. Of course, Geoffrey Bertram did not get mooned by the monk because he was too spiritual or just because he said no to a new pair of drawers. Another contributing factor to the mooning was due to Geoffrey Bertram giving Andres Wood to a nearby hospital. The monks did not like him doing that. It is understandable they did not care for that decision. In the Middle Ages, wood was a valuable resource. For example, the Chronicle of the Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds documents monastic efforts to ensure the best wood remained in monastic hands. But I digress. Let's return to the monk at Andres. In short, the monk mooning his abbot was the result of many contributing factors and escalating tensions. It was also the incident that made Geoffrey Bertram realize he was never really going to gain the favor of his community, especially because no one really did anything to that bold monk. Um, he, Geoffrey, saw that no one agreed with the things he was doing. Thus, staying at Andres was not the wisest decision career-wise. He ended up resigning as abbot and went to another monastery. In my opinion, uh, he got off pretty lucky with just seeing someone's bare bottom. It was not unheard of for angry monks to try to murder hated abbots. Example seven. Besides real life historical evidence, there's also literary evidence monks wore underwear. In the 12th century French poem, uh, Montagad Guillaume, again, I apologize for pronunciation. I tried to find it online. I spent a while looking. I couldn't find uh, how to pronounce the first word. Um, but anyway, in this French poem, the main character, William, has become a monk, and before he leaves to go on a trip, his abbot warns him about potential bandits who may try to rob him. The abbot tells William if the bandits take his habit, he needs to just let them have it. However, if they try to take his drawers, he is allowed to fight back to protect his modesty. And those are our seven pieces of historical evidence. Again, there are many more examples out there, but I had to stop somewhere and I chose seven. While doing research, I came across several different English terms for medieval underwear. 
Uh, they're referred to as drawers, braids, and breeches. However, in medieval Latin, there are two terms. The first one is femoralia, and the second term is brachae. Again, um, I apologize for any mispronunciations. Uh, these terms refer to the clothing's cut. Depending on the century, the cut of a monk's underwear would vary. Even in the same century, a monk might own two different kinds of underwear. For example, Abbot Raoul of St. Remy complained about drawers for two completely opposite reasons. His first complaint had to do with drawers that were made out of fine thread. According to him, these left very little to the imagination. Abbot Roll also complained about underwear that used too much fabric. He considered these items to be much too baggy. For a time at Farfa Abbey, the pattern for monastic underwear was pretty standard. A pair of drawers measured twice the circumference of a monk. It was also supposed to be a foot from the crotch to the top. Shorter monks could roll their underwear so they would fit. At 14th century Westminster, a pair of underwear was made out of two L's of cloth. Two L's is the equivalent of about two and a half yards. This meant that drawers could be pretty long. However, around 1350, only a yard to a yard and a quarter was allowed for one pair of drawers. Monastic underwear was usually made out of linen. According to one of Augustine's sermons, linen was purer than wool. After all, linen came from a plant, so no sex was required to make it. Linen also represented the inward and the spiritual, while wool represented the outward and the physical. It should be noted that this tidbit has only been found in one manuscript. However, even if Augustine himself didn't think that, it does imply that the scribe writing down the manuscript might have. Now that I am done describing the cut, and the cloth of monastic underwear, it's time to get to the fun part, the discourse. Obviously, I've already provided evidence that most monks did wear underwear. The key word in that sentence is most. As previously mentioned, there was some debate over whether or not a monk should actually wear underwear. One reason for the discourse can be traced back to St. Benedict's wording. St. Benedict lived in a Mediterranean climate, so it was warm enough to go commando. However, for monks in colder areas, this was not practical. St. Benedict knew this and made sure to clarify that northern monks were allowed to wear more clothes. As the rule was written in the early 6th century, this gave monks and abbots plenty of time to argue what exactly he meant by more clothes and wearing underwear. One argument was whether or not that the act of wearing drawers was Christian or pagan. In the early Middle Ages, pagans, Germanic tribes, were associated with pants, while Christians, the Romans, were associated with tunics. Priests were expected to wear drawers while on the altar. When more and more monks started to become priests, this was an issue. If monks weren't allowed to wear underwear, but priests had to, what was the proper thing to do? Aeneas of Paris argued that drawers signified chastity. Around the same time, Smargardus of St. Michel thought people should let monks wear drawers if they wanted to. He also did not want underwear-wearing monks to be shamed if they did wear them. Several centuries after Aeneas of Paris' death, the Cistercians considered them unwholesome. And this brings us to the Cistercians. For context, by the 9th century, pretty much everyone was on board with monks and priests wearing underwear. Of course, you had some religious figures that didn't do it. There were also some reforms in the 11th century about it. But generally speaking, wearing underwear was an accepted and expected practice. Then the Cistercian Order was founded in 1098. The Cistercian founder was named Robert of Molema. He later became a saint. Uh, Robert created the Cistercian order because he thought the Benedictine order had become too lax when it came to following the rule of St. Benedict. The Cistercians were determined to follow the rule of St. Benedict as closely as possible. So this meant they were going to focus on physical labor, they were going to live an aesthetic lifestyle, they were going to be disciplined, and they were also not going to wear underwear. And pretty much everyone else went, that's stupid going to make fun of you for it. A lot of the Cistercians' contemporaries had a lot of opinions on the matter. 
the chronicler and Benedictine monk or Derek Vitalis wrote a defense about wearing underwear. So did another Benedictine monk, uh, Rupert of Duez. Hildegard of Bingen argued that, yes, while people in St. Benedict's Day didn't wear underwear, times had changed. Uh, Hildegard was also an abbess, and nuns were allowed to wear underwear for uh, practical reasons. Meanwhile, the courier Walter Mapp had an absolute field day with the fact Cistercians didn't wear underwear. See, Walter Mapp already hated the Cistercians, so this little tidbit made it even easier for him to make fun of them. Walter Mapp documented his thoughts about this matter in his book, De Nugis uh, Curialium. In English, this translates to Courier's Trifles. I'm going to read you a passage from Courier's Trifles. It discusses how the Cistercians will wear underwear on the altar, but nowhere else, why they don't wear underwear, and that story I mentioned previously about the monk and the king. Of course, it is important to remember that Walter Mapp did not like the Cistercians, so this information may not be 100% factually accurate. Anyway, let's begin. Quote, In regard to the scantiness of clothing, there is a curious rule, meseemeth, concerning the use of breeches. These they must wear in their service at the altars. And after they have withdrawn, they lay them off. This is a respect which is shown to sacred vestments, but these breeches are not sacred, nor reckoned among the apparel of priest or Levite, nor are they blessed. They serve as an emblem, however, to cover the privy parts, thus seeming to mark the secrets of love and to prevent their disclosure. Their reason for not always wearing breeches is, as a certain man explained to me, that they may, forsooth, suffer from cold in those parts, that their passion be not aroused, and they be not impelled to adultery, God forbid. And their undershirts are cut off short below the belt, leaving the utmost portion, and thus those regions of the body which should be concealed are not covered by an honorable garment in accordance with a religious scruple which is approved elsewhere. Our Lord, King Henry II, not long ago was riding in front of his endless number of soldiers and priests, talking with Master Ricus, a great monk and an upright man. The wind was blowing hard, and suddenly a white monk, who was hastening his steps along the street, saw them and made haste to turn aside. He dashed his foot against a stone, nor on this occasion was he borne up by the angels. Down he fell in front of the king's horse. The wind lifted his garment round his neck, so that before the unwilling eyes of the king and of Rikus was displayed the bare truth of his privy parts. The king, as one with a never-failing supply of good breeding, pretended not to see, turned his head away, and held his peace. Rikus, however, exclaimed aside, Curses on a religion that beareth the rump. I heard his remark, and was sorry that reverence was thus derided, though the wind was within its rights in falling upon regions exposed to it. If, however, the Cistercians can endure scarcity of food, rough clothing, hard toil, and such single inconveniences as they describe, but cannot contain their lust and need the wind to act as a check for Venus, it is well that they do without breeches and are exposed to the breezes. I know that our flesh, although it is of earth and not of heaven, doth not need such shields for these battles, because without Circes and Bacchus our Venus is chilled. But perchance the goddess hurleth her attack more boldly against the en those enemies whom she knoweth are more firmly guarded. However, this may be, the fallen monk would have arisen with more dignity if his body had not been closely confined. And that is the end of the passage. Uh, I think this excerpt does a pretty good job displaying what most people thought about the Cistercian's stance on underwear. It certainly made them the butt of the joke. Anyway, uh, this is where I will end this episode for today. I hope you enjoyed my discussion on medieval monastic underwear. You can find a full translation of Walter Mapp's uh, Courier's Trifles on the Internet Archive. I've provided a link to the source in my article on monastic underwear, again, as well as all the other sources I used uh, in case you are interested in uh, doing further research on this topic. I will also note um, that I'm going to be having surgery soon, so the next uh, 
episode of this podcast um, might be out in a few weeks. It's going to totally depend on how I'm feeling after the surgery and so on. Uh, so if I'm missing, uh, that's why I'm just not feeling well. And uh, hopefully that's the only reason. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any suggestions for what the next episode should be, definitely let me know. Um, I have an Instagram, a Patreon, a YouTube channel. I have all sorts of stuff if you are interested in following me for more content. And thank you so much for listening. Until next time, stay safe out there.